This is Computer Programming One from the University of Washington. Welcome back. I'm Martin Dickey. And today we'll be talking about functions and design. We've talked about functions quite a bit in this course, and we won't be finished with it even after today. Functions are a very important tool in creating and structuring programs. But today's lecture will be a little different in that we're not talking about any new syntactical details or concepts relating to functions. We're going to be talking about how we use functions in solving problems and in designing solutions. Among the things we'll see today is an overview of the design process from a functional point of view, which leads to the notion of a functional decomposition. We'll discuss two general strategies for solving problems this way, a top-down and a bottom-up approach. And we'll also take a detour and look at graphics primitives, which we might use to create solutions to problems involving computer graphics. Let's start, in fact, by setting ourselves a graphics problem. Computer graphics have become quite amazing. Video games, special effects in movies, advertising, and television have made us all aware of the great advances in computer graphics. Instead of trying to amaze the world, let's try to give ourselves a problem that's solvable within the context of what we know now and a little bit that I'll introduce today about graphics. The problem is going to be drawing a house. Not only the house I've shown here, but if we're careful and clever about it, we should be able to make the same program stretch to draw more than one house. This is typical of the approach of computer scientists. Instead of trying to solve a single problem one time only, they look for ways to solve a more general problem so that the solution could be reused. One way to get started with this process is to look at examples of the problems you're going to solve and try to figure out what's similar about them and what's different about them. It's a little bit like a popular cartoon that you see on the funny pages. It shows two panels, and the reader is invited to say, what is the difference between these two panels? Let's look at these two houses and articulate what's similar and what's different about them. Well, one obvious difference is their color. And although it might be obvious, we ought to take the time to note that difference. What else? Well, the number of windows is different. Because the number of windows is different, the placement of the doors is different. The doors have the same color, however, in both examples. What is the same between these two? Well, the overall shapes are the same. The roof is a triangle. The body of the house, we might call it, is a square or perhaps a rectangle. And there are other rectangles as well. The windows, the doors are rectangles, and there's also a circle being used as the doorknob. Those features are in common. Having done this, maybe we can try to put together a short resume of what the salient features of this drawing should be in terms of these features that are similar and different. When we notice things that are different, we're often alert to parameters, information that we have to give to a function for it to do its job. If we have a common function that can be parameterized, then we're on the right track to having a general solution which can solve more than one instance of a particular problem. Let's summarize what we have so far in what looks a little bit like C and what looks a little bit like English, but isn't either one. We call this pseudocode. It's not meant to be compilable, but it is meant to be a little crisper and clearer than everyday English. The overall goal is to draw a house. So I've listed that first. And I've used parameter notation to indicate the things that are different. Color and the number of windows we've already talked about. There's another difference that may not be obvious from the two examples I showed you 
but is typical of the sort of thing we might want to have in a real drawing system. And that is the placement of the house in the drawing screen. We might want a house to be on the left side of the screen for one project and on the right hand for the other. In order to, to accommodate this, let's add two additional parameters for the location of the x and y coordinates. Lower left x and lower left y, LLX and LLY, are intended to have this function. Overall, we have a function to draw a house. Now, what do I need to do to draw that house, given these parameters? Well, the overall high-level functions seem to be drawing the body of the house. And we see that that's a colored rectangle. The roof is a colored triangle. Then I have to draw doors and windows. But what I do here is a little bit conditional, depending on how many windows I have. If there's one, I'll draw a door and draw a window. If there are two, I'll draw a door, but then I can call draw a window twice. A certain amount of parameterization has been left out here because the doors and windows also have locations that we'll have to be able to specify. They also have colors. So this is not by any means a complete specification of a C program, not something we could start coding from, but a good start in our analysis of the problem. As a way of further visualizing the relationship between these parts of our proposed solution, uh, programmers often like to draw a chart to show how the pieces of the solution, the functions, fit together. We've drawn similar charts for solutions in the past. At the top of the chart, we put the main function of the solution, which is not the main of the C program, but the function draw house. Its major parts are the four functions draw body, draw roof, draw door, and draw window. Now we've identified that in order to carry out those tasks, we'll need to apply some graphics and at least we need these parts. The body involves a rectangle. The roof involves a triangle. The door involves a rectangle and a circle. The window involves rectangles and line, perhaps. And perhaps there are more than one ways we could do some of these operations. We call this a calling tree or a static call graph. Notice near the bottom of the chart, rectangle is used three places. Now. If we're smart, or if we have access to a good graphics package, we will not have to have three completely separate functions for drawing rectangles. We'll have one function, which would be parameterized, and it would be called, with the proper parameters, where needed in order to draw a rectangle of required size, shape, position, and color. To emphasize the fact that there aren't three different functions rectangle, we sometimes draw the calling uh, chart this way, with the word rectangle used only once, and then lines coming to that one word from wherever it's needed. This exercise of drawing a functional decomposition as a starting point in the design is often extremely helpful. The point is not to make a pretty picture out of the chart, but help understanding and see how the pieces fit together. This is also a technique you can use when you're given a program to analyze. This happens frequently in the real world. Programmers are given existing code, sometimes very long and complicated code, by programmers who have left for greener pastures or been promoted or disappeared. Taking a program someone else has written and trying to make sense of it can often be a very daunting task. Sitting down, analyzing which functions call which other functions, Drawing a chart like this can be extremely helpful. In this problem, however, we're not analyzing the code. We're going to create the code. So we're going in the direction from design to programming. We've spent some time analyzing the problem, but as we'll see, we're not done with that phase of it yet. As we go down the tree, we'll have to do more detailed analysis for individual pieces. We've done what seems like a good starting point for a big picture solution. Now perhaps we could turn ourselves, our attention to the design of the individual functions. Here, our choices and our decisions may be based upon 
what other functions already exist in libraries over which we have no control or which cannot further be broken down. These are sometimes referred to as primitives. The final programming that we do may be extremely detailed and require great care. This is one of the strange things about programming as an occupation. One has to be able to think at a very high creative global gestalt level and at the same time be able to worry about the finest and most minute of details. When we approach a design problem, there are a couple ways we could come at it. Sometimes we start from the big picture and work our way down into the smaller pieces and then to those fine, minute details. This is called a top-down approach. On the other hand, especially if we know what all the primitives are and we understand them very well, we could start in the other direction, figuring out how the little pieces could be fit together into larger pieces and how those could be fit together into increasingly larger pieces until eventually we reach the solution that we want to at the top. This is called the bottom-up approach. What are we doing here today? Well, we're doing a little bit of both. We've started uh, looking at the problem from a top-down point of view. But we will have to look ahead and see what's available at the lowest level in terms of the graphics primitives. This will, in some measure, constrain the solutions that we can use. So let's pause a minute and talk about some possible graphics primitives. Now, there are many, many packages for doing graphics programming. You may have heard of some of them, uh, such as OpenGL. Some of these are fairly standard. Others are specific to particular compilers, operating systems, manufacturers, or applications. Most of them have a similar framework. They operate on an XY coordinate system, although the origin is not always 0, 0, as I've shown here. Within the coordinate system, points on the screen are generally identified by two values, an X and a Y system, just as they are uh, in analytic geometry in math. In addition to the position on the screen, objects have uh, attributes like their color, their fill, their background, uh, and so forth, which you're familiar with if you used presentation or other uh, end user types of graphics packages. Within these graphics packages or libraries, there are primitives to do particular functions. Now, let's look at what a typical rectangle function might look like. The details in uh, uh, one package or another might be different. But if we want to draw a rectangle, we have to have some way of specifying what the corners are and how large it is and where it is. There are actually a number of choices about how this could be done. We could give all the coordinates. We could give opposite uh, points. We could give uh, four lines. What's been chosen in this example is to give five parameters. One is the color, which we'll interpret as some integer that the system understands to be a color. And then two points in the plane, which requires four parameters. The lower left corner of the rectangle and the upper right corner of the rectangle. Is this the only way it could be done? Well, not necessarily. But that's the way it was done in this package. So before designing and programming with this package, it, you would have to sit down and study the particular functions that were available so that you could match the expected parameter values. Another function that we might find useful is a line. Uh, in the system we're using here, a line is specified by two endpoints, which is four parameters, and apparently no option for anything like thickness or color. Let's take a look at our big picture again to see where this comes in. If we have graphics prim primitives for the function at the lowest level, triangle, rectangle, circle, and line, then we don't have to do any design at that point. What we do have to do is educate ourselves about how those things work and then remember what we've learned as we design the pieces in the middle level. Let's just take one of those four functions to do in some detail. Let's take draw window as an example and study how we might implement it. 
Here's a picture of a window. If you look at this and think of the graphics primitives available, you might come up with a number of different ways of drawing this. So we wouldn't have to use rectangles at all. We could use a series of line segments. Perhaps I could outline the four uh, outer parts of the window and then two more lines for the uh, cross hatching. Or perhaps I wouldn't use lines at all. Perhaps I could just draw two rectangles or four rectangles or perhaps some combination. Perhaps I would draw a rectangle and then two lines for the cross hatching. So what we do depends upon the primitives that are available as well as our creativity in combining them. Whatever we do, we'll have to be able to supply information about where the window is to be and what size it is. It often helps to give symbolic names to some of these constants. We can use these in a program as well as during our analysis. So a, t a typical uh, attribute of something like this might be the width. Um, we have win w at the bottom, meaning the width of the window, and win h on the right hand side standing for the height. Now the window in the application examples we saw looked as if it was divided evenly at midpoints. So another constant might be mid x which you can see might be half of the window width and mid y which is half of the window height. These dimensions will help us get the parameters right when we finally call the graphics package. Finally, we'll need some way of telling the package where to put these, uh, the objects that it draws. Okay. This is the sort of procedure, then, that we're going to go through for one particular function. Look for constants that might be relevant to describing the problem. Decide what's going to be a parameter. and Utilize the primitives that are available. This will help determine what the parameter values will be. A lot of little picky details to get right. If we carry this out further, here's what we might come up with. A function named draw window, which has two parameters, the lower left corner of the window. Now, if we're only passing two parameters, we won't be able to draw windows of different sizes. But the examples of houses we saw didn't require that. All the windows there were the same size. So perhaps location of the window is the only uh, uh, parameter that needs to be passed in. On the other hand, the primitives line and rectangle needed more information. One corner was not enough for drawing a rectangle. We needed to have two corners. Fortunately, once I thought through the size and assigned names to the dimensions, I can calculate one corner of the window given the other. And you see that's what I've done within the call to rectangle. X and Y correspond to one corner. Then X plus window width, Y plus window height correspond to the other. If this isn't clear, go back to the previous chart and look at it, or better yet, Draw your own picture and see if you can make it match up to the code here. Similar analysis will lead us to a correct set of parameters for the two lines. And you can see what the choice the programmer has made here among all those possible ways to draw windows. The programmer has chosen to draw one large rectangle and then two intersecting lines at right angles for the cross hatching for the window panes. What we've done at this point is complete the detailed code for just one function, draw window. The next step would be to go on and do draw door. I have a feeling you don't really want me to do that now. And I'm not sure I want to either. But you have the tools and the concepts now that you could do this. And you might want to do that before continuing and seeing the answer. Then we could go on and analyze draw body in the same way and draw roof. Once we have these functions specified and coded, we can go back to draw house and see how the functions need to be called to draw the complete house. 
Interesting question there in the last line of the screen. Does the order matter? That is, the order in which we implement these functions. The answer to that is not always obvious. It's not always clear which function you should start with. But here's an interesting idea. If you had many of these functions to do, and not a lot of time to do them, and you had lots of programmers on your team, you might divide the job up so that each person had one function or two functions or some small set of functions. Each person could work independently on their functions and then pass those along to the person writing the draw house function. This is actually the way most software development is done. It is done by teams of people. To make this work, it's extremely important that the functions be as independent from one another as possible so that knowing how draw w door works is not required for knowing how draw window works. Once we finish these mid-level functions, we can go back and do draw house. Now, by the time we get to this, we'll, we'll have discovered a lot of constants that we will need, a lot of dimensions, and I won't show all of this on the chart, but you'll be able to get a flavor by going through this. And in fact, you can do a little mind reading and figure out what parts are left out. So the draw house function itself, as we analyzed early on, needs to know the color, the position, the lower left corner of the house, and the number of windows. It could start by drawing the body of the house, calling a function that we've completed designing. Then it would continue and draw a roof. Now, the position of the roof will depend upon some parameters which draw house knows about, but draw roof doesn't. So there could be some calculations involved in preparing those parameters. Draw door and draw window will depend or re receive information that depends on the location, and that depends on the number of windows. So the draw house function will be responsible for making that test condition if Windows is one and taking appropriate action. In one case, it will compute a certain set of parameters. And in the other case of two windows, another set of parameters. If all this looks very detailed, you're right, it is. If it looks like it may, might be hard to get right, well, it can be. But taking it slowly and methodically uh, will help. The next step would be to draw a neighborhood. Now you understand why I chose to wear a sweater today. In the tradition of Mr. Rogers, I'm inviting you into my neighborhood. We could do this same analysis as a problem that starts with six houses and contains six triangles, six big blocks, six doors, and so forth. We could certainly solve the problem that way. We come up with a pretty big draw neighborhood function. But it might be much smarter just to take what we've already done, the draw house function, and call it six times, computing the appropriate parameters for colors and locations uh, as we needed them. Let's summarize what we've done today. In solving a problem of this nature, we try to look for the common elements, things that must be done, and things that might be different from one case to another can be parametrized as special features that will be interpreted as the functions are executed. Then, determining which functions use each other's will lead us to a graph that shows the overall relationship and design of the system. I'd like to add that the process of designing a solution to a problem uh, is not an easy one. It is a significant challenge. It's one that designers and programmers become better with, with practice. You can look for design patterns, but if you haven't already done a lot of designing and coding, you won't see familiar ones. That's why experience and practice is very important. It's strange but true, but programmers are often called upon to solve problems about which they really have no knowledge at all. And they have to be able to apply general principles of design and their specific knowledge of programming to situations which might be completely different from anyone they've ever seen in their career before. 
It's quite a challenge and one of these things that makes this a fascinating field. I hope you'll join me for the next lecture as we continue the discussion of programming and design in C.